Paul's writing style is that he kind of ends with a flurry of encouragements, like, hey, don't forget this, say hi to this, greet this person, do this, right? It's just this flurry of, of different points that Paul is trying to wrap up his, his letter with, right? So he's already communicated the main point, um, the, the, the thrust of Philippians, uh, you kind of see in Philippians 3 when Paul says, hey, knowing Jesus and being like him is, is of greater value and worth than anything else, right? And so this is someone who, uh, in the eyes of the world, had made it, was successful, um, right, had power and influence, um, and, and he looked at everything he had, and he said, man, knowing the grace of Christ and, and being with him is greater than everything else, even if it was something good, right? It's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't compare to knowing Jesus. Um, and, and so then he encourages us, hey, stand firm, press on after Christ, right? Like let everything else kind of fade away and press on to know Jesus. There will be things that get in our way. There will be things that try to detour us. Um, but if we fix our eyes on him and press on toward knowing him, it's a prize of greater value and worth than anything else you can devote your life to. And so the kind of the, the gist of Philippians, right, is, is pursuing Jesus, letting your life be a life that honors him at every moment in every situation. There's nothing of greater value. Right? That, that's what I think Paul would want to, to encourage us with. And then as we get to the chapter four, right, he's kind of wrapping it up and giving us these commands, these ways, these imperatives to live that out to live out a life that is pursuing Jesus. Last week in verses uh, two and three of chapter four, we talked about agreeing together, right? That the enemy wants to create division within the church. In John 17, remember Jesus is praying for us and he's praying for believers in, throughout the history of the world that we would be united together in love just as Jesus the son is united with Jesus the father. Christian theology believes there's one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit, and they are so intricately and intimately united that they are one. That you have three unique, Father, Son, and Spirit, but so connected and united that they are one. And then he says, hey, church, um, people that, that you may be related by blood or you, you may have just met someone recently, if you have the same spiritual DNA inside of you, then be united with one another in such a close and loving way that you look just like the unity that you see in the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so the devil's like, okay, well, let's create some division because that poorly reflects this God of love. And so that's part of his aim. Hey, argue with one another. Fight against one another. Lie to one another, right? So, so last week, Paul was like, hey, come on. Agree together in the Lord. It's not about your way, it's not about my way, it's about the Lord's way. It's not about what you want, it's not about what I want, it's about what the Lord wants. Let's agree together in the Lord. And then today, we're going to read and we get four different imperative commands. The, the third one is actually two, two verbs in one kind of point, but you get four different points imperative verbs imperative verbs are, are the they're, they're the commands of scripture that god expects us to obey right Any, anybody play sports high school or above level awesome we got a, we got a couple around here right so you have a coach did your coach ever bark out orders and commands yeah and and what was the expectation when that command was given do it do it or or else sucker right like do it. now here's the thing Get in, you raise your hand. What'd you, what'd you play? Football. Let's go with football. I swam too. Huh. It's harder to hear their commands though because your head is under the water a little bit. Right? So you'd be like, I don't know what you said, coach. Anyways, but football, right? So if your coach is telling you to do something, the expectation getting is that you will do it, right? Now here's the deal. I can go and observe that practice and I can understand the, what the commands are that the coach is saying. I can think, man, that's a really fascinating command. Like, yes, that's a good, that's a good imperative command that he's giving Gideon. But if I'm not on the team, there's zero expectation for me to obey that command, right? But if I'm on the team, how much expectation is there? Yeah, 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 you better, right? If we are Christians... 
if we are united into the family of God by faith in Jesus, then when we see an imperative command, it is expected that we will obey. It's expected that we don't just go like, ah, oh, that's a good suggestion, or yeah, maybe that'd be great for some other people. It's expected that we look at this and go, okay, this is what my king is telling me to do. I will set that to, in my life to do that. Right? Now, we're a work in progress. We're, we're going to continue to grow in that. We're going to continue to, sometimes you don't always obey your coach's command. You got to go do burpees or you got to run laps or something, right? Like, we're going to continue to grow, but when we see these commands, we just need to know, okay, if I have accepted Christ, these are not optional for me. I have said yes to Jesus, and I have said yes to all of his commands. All right, what are they? What is God telling us to do? All right, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 10. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. We've got four imperative points that Paul is telling us. If we are Christians, and if you're not a Christian, and you're like, I might want to be. Okay, this is part of what it looks like then to follow Jesus. These four imperative commands that we are to obey. One, rejoice in the Lord always. Two, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Three, do not be anxious in anything, but pray. That's the one that has two verbs in it, making the same, the same point, really. Four, think about what is true and good and right and, and so on. Right, these are the four imperative verbs that these sections of verses give us. That when they're communicated, they're communicated, hey, if you're going to follow Jesus, it is expected that you go, yep, I'm in for this. May not do it perfectly today, but I'll work on it more tomorrow and the next day and really for the rest of our lives. But I'm in. I'm in for this. So let's talk about these imperative verbs that Paul gives us. If we're pressing on after Jesus. If we're standing firm and being wise, okay, let's talk about these four things that he tells us to do. The first one, rejoice in the Lord always. Paul is writing from jail. Literally, um, most assume that he has a, a chain connected between him and a, a guard, right? And so he is writing from jail saying, hey, rejoice always. The imperative expected command, rejoice always. Now, what does it mean to rejoice, right? If I'm like, Bailey, rejoice. And her first reaction is, do tell. And, in what? What am I rejoicing? Like, I need more context here. Why am I rejoicing? Right? That command itself is kind of, is kind of odd. Joy is the, the noun, the feeling of, of happiness, of, of pleasure, of cheerfulness. And joy exists because something in your life has produced that joy. Rejoicing, then, is the expressions we make because of the presence of joy in our life. I have joy, therefore I rejoice. I express that joy, I emote those feelings, right? So a few months ago on a Sunday, um, we discovered that the UT football team made the college football playoffs, right? The fact, if you care about UT football, which I know is one or two of you, right? If you care about UT football, the fact that they made the playoffs most likely put a joy inside of you. You had joy because your team made the playoffs. And then the rejoicing began. Huzzah! Right? Yes! Whatever that rejoicing may look like, there was a joy inside of you because your team made the playoffs, and then I could say, Bailey, you team made the, made the playoffs. Rejoice! And she could go, yes! Hook them! Gigamags, whatever it looks like, right? 
And so rejoicing follows the joy that is in us. Now, now the, uh, the command is to rejoice always. All the time, all the time, all the time. Rejoice. The thing with this command is it, it can seem odd and maybe even cruel if the circumstances of your life are not producing so much joy. Right? If the circumstances of your life, which we all know because we've lived more than 10 minutes, are not so good, in fact, perhaps they're, they're quite miserable or you're going through a dark time of suffering. And then Paul's like, hey, rejoice always. I, that, you know, the last time I think Stephanie was kind of grumpy and I was like, hey, rejoice. Like, how's that going to go for you? You know? It's like, I will cut you, sir. Like, we will not talk. You know, and so it's just like, it's kind of an interesting thing to command us to rejoice always when sometimes life is not so full of rejoicing. Right? Perhaps when you've been praying this same prayer, this good prayer, for, for weeks, months, years even, and it just seems like it's going unanswered. Hey, rejoice always. Perhaps when you have a chronic illness that the doctors can't even figure out what's going on. Rejoice always. When you've lost a loved one of, of either life or, or trust and it feels like this family unit, this world is just crumbling. Hey, rejoice always. When, when you don't know, am I going to pay rent next month? How will I feed my children? Rejoice always. Right? It can almost seem... Anybody else like, dude, Paul, shut up. Like, that's mean to tell me to rejoice when life is miserable. I love that the Bible doesn't discount our sorrows at all. Like, God doesn't tell us to, like, stick our head in the sand or ignore the fact that, that we're going to have trials and tribulations and suffering. Matthew 5, Jesus says, blessed are those that mourn. In John 11, Jesus wept at the death of his friend, Lazarus. Romans 12, 15, we are instructed to weep with those who weep. Nearly half of the Psalms contain lament, a, a, a grieving and crying out towards God. Psalm 42, the psalmist writes, my tears have been my food day and night. Hey, rejoice always. Psalm 34, it says that the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. Right, so the Bible doesn't dismiss the reality that you and I all know, which is some days are just plain terrible and, and miserable. And, and you would love to do a 360 scan and find something, you're like, oh great, I can rejoice in this and I can maybe not feel all of this weight and dark. Anyone else ever felt that way before? where like the command to rejoice always just makes you want to fight someone because life is so hard and it feels cruel, which is why what Paul tells us to rejoice in is so important. Rejoice in the Lord always. Right? The, the Bible seems to suggest that we can both hold our suffering and misery and rejoicing in the Lord at the same time. That we don't have to like bury our suffering and, and you know, put on a happy face, like, oh, everything's good. How are you, brother? I'm good, better than I deserve. And everything is just miserable at home and our marriage is falling apart and our kids have taken off, right? And we don't know how we're gonna pay for things. I'm good, brother, I'm great. No, I think it's okay for us to, the Bible seems to be very clear. No, weep when it's time to weep. Suffer when it's time to to suffer, and at the same time, we can hold on to the Lord and say, is his promise still true? Yes, then I can rejoice in that. It, do I have forgiveness and eternity in Christ? Yes, I can rejoice in that. W will he always be with me? Yes, I can rejoice in that. Does he promise that he will 
leverage and use and redeem what is evil today for good. Yes, and I can rejoice and I can suffer and I can hold on to the reality that we grieve sometimes, but I can always still go, he is still the same and the truth today. I can rejoice in who he is in spite of my terrible circumstances. That's how we don't spiral into a dark oblivion and never come out is not by ignoring the darkness but by holding on to the light of Jesus who is the same yesterday today and forever so that that light can guide us through the darkness we have to rejoice always in the Lord because he is good and always will be and he is true and it's in that rejoicing that's what's going to get us through the darkness we have to hold on to that light. And so Paul says, rejoice always in the Lord. The next thing he tells us is to let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Paul says, man, Jesus is coming back soon. And if Paul thought that Jesus was coming back soon, what, 2,000 years ago? How much closer are we today? Right, the Lord is coming back soon. I don't know when. It could be today, it could be tomorrow, it could be next week. And, and Paul says, the Lord is at hand, he's near. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. Set, set another way, let your gentle and easy to get along with spirit be experienced by everybody. Everyone that comes in contact with you finds that you're a gentle and easy to be around person. Are, are you an easy to be around person? Right? Are, you, are, you, are you reasonable? Or do people have to walk on eggshells when they get around you? Do people have to filter everything they say so that they don't tip you over the edge and spiral you into some outburst or, or experience your grumpy wrath? No, we're to let our reasonableness be known because the Lord is at hand. I think about just some of the things that we we get all up in arms about that have minimal, if any, real matter in life. I mean, think about your home. Where's my shirt? Who wore it last? Right, and it's just like, oh dear, my God, don't touch the shirt, you know? And so, so then we're like, well, I don't wanna set this person off because I don't know how this is gonna end. I might not need to go to sleep. Or Macy tells me all the time, sleep with one eye open, you know? And she's just joking, but you know, what if we really, had, what if we really felt that way? with people, with our roommates, with our spouses, like, oh my gosh, this might go real bad. Or at work, right? Do, do our coworkers, do our employees, are they super nervous when it comes to, do we walk in and they're like tense and rigid because they don't know if we're gonna blow up, they don't know if we're having a bad day, they don't know how we're gonna react, and they're just, we're just not easy to be around. We're not, we're not gentle, easygoing. Right, I think traffic, right? Like, do, would people be fearful of our violence when we're driving? Right, do, does this anger come out of us? I think, man, the number of times in church, right? Are people nervous to ask you to lend a hand? Because, oh, and it's like, oh, I just want to ask. I just want to ask. I don't want to deal with it, right? Paul says, let your reasonableness be gentle and easygoing. Why? Because the Lord is at hand. Jesus is coming back. Be inviting and warm with the gospel in your life. Like, don't be someone that people want to stay away from. Be someone that people want to move into and near to so they can encounter Christ through you. Time is running out. Don't, don't be harsh, edgy, wound tight, let it go, be reasonable, are you a reasonable person, be honest with yourself, right, if you're not, okay, let's own it, let's own it, we don't have to, you don't have to stay there, but we got to start with honesty, are you, are you difficult to be around, if you call someone, are they thinking, oh no, what's this going to be? 
Right? If you, if you set a meeting with a coworker, they're thinking. Be honest. Own it. Ask someone to be honest for you. Just say, hey, shoot me incredibly straight. Am I difficult to be around? And then, if you are, just commit to working on that. And nobody's perfect. We all got our spots that we need to work on. Okay, so I'm a difficult, grouchy person. People walk on eggshells with me. All right, I'm going to work on that. And just over time, begin identifying those places that seem to make you edgy and grouchy and be like, nope, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be mindful of this. I'm going to transform my thoughts to be more Christ-like here. Let your reasonableness be known. The Lord is at hand. The next thing he says is be anxious about nothing. Rather in everything, pray. Do not be anxious about anything. Jesus also said the same thing. We are to be anxious about nothing. We live in a statistically high anxiety age, higher than ever before in history. How do we know? Based on doctor's data of appointments and prescriptions for anti-anxiety meds, it is higher than ever in the history of our world. And we live in a wound tight, scared of the unknowns in the future and the what-ifs around us. We what-if ourselves to death. What if this happens? What if this goes wrong? What if that ends up bad? What if this, what if, what if, and we're constantly trying to solve for all the possible what-ifs, thus making us incredibly wound tight and anxious about life. Anxiety is not a concern for things, right? Just because you care about something doesn't mean you're anxious. Right? Paul had a holy ambition. Right? He, had, he had a desire to plant churches. He cared about things. Anxiety, I, I found this interesting in studying this week. The historical etymology defines anxiety or worry as to choke or be strangled with persistent nagging agitation. I was like, dang, that's... That is, that is good. Why do we get away from that definition? To have anxiety is to be strangled internally with this persistent agitation, this persistent nagging. It's when the what-ifs and the unknowns start to take control of our lives, to alter how we live normally, right? What if I go through this intersection and I get T-boned? What if it happens again? What if this car is not controlled? And, and now we're no longer going to intersections. Right? Our life is being controlled by the, the what ifs that frighten us. What if I lose my job and, and can't pay my rent? I've got to save everything. I've got to hoard everything. I've got to keep everything because what if everything goes south? And, and now we're, we're people who are holding tightly to our money and we're turning inward and we're no longer living generously with the people around us. That, that's an anxiety that has taken a stranglehold of our lives. What if this headache is a tumor? I need to go to the doctor. What if this stomach ache is an ulcer? Right? What if this is cancer? What if, and, and now we're, we're working ourselves up into a frenzy. All that's anxiety. We're, we're terrified of the unknowns and the what ifs. Right? There's, a, there's both an irrational fear and some irrational, but they've taken control of our lives. And, and we all have those, right? We all struggle with different anxieties. And, and Jesus and Paul says, be anxious about nothing. There's nothing that is to have that anxiety over us. Why does God care about us being anxious about nothing? One, because God cares for us. Right? His creation, Genesis 1 and 2, were good and peaceful and flourishing, there was shalom, a human flourishing, right? Jesus in John 10 said that he came that we would have abundant life. How many of us, if we were writing out, defining what does abundant life look like, would, would put anxiety in there? Right? How many of us would say like, oh, I'm just, like worrying about the what ifs of life? hesitant to, to step forward because I don't know the future. How many of us would define what Jesus came and gave his life, abundant life, would say, okay, that looks like anxiety? No. It is not what God created us for. And so we can't, we can't settle for that. We can't accept that in our lives. It's not what Jesus came for. 
Not only that, though, anxiety is a poor demonstration of the loving Father that we have. Jesus, he says that God is such a loving Father that if we take the best human earthly father and compare him to God the Father, that God's so good as a father, he makes the best human earthly father seem wicked. Like he makes the best earthly parent seem wicked because he's so good. Right, so, so take, uh, take our kids. How many of our kids are anxious about tomorrow? If they've got good parents, how many of them are anxious about eating tomorrow, right? Is Milo worried about getting fed? No, he's like, let's go to mom and dad. They'll, they'll, they'll take care of me, right? There's no anxiety there. And so if we're living anxious about tomorrow, what does that communicate about our loving, good father who cares for us? What kind of father do we apparently have if we're worried about making it tomorrow? If we're anxious about being okay? It's a poor representation of who God is if we live in anxiety. It reflects poorly on him. And so we are to be anxious about nothing. And so what do we do about that? Right? Have you ever, have you ever been anxious and you're like, stop it? Anybody? How'd that work for you? Right? Or you're, you're, you're talking with someone and they're just like wound up with anxiety and you're like, stop being anxious. Like, how'd that go? Like, you can't just be like, hey, I'm a, I don't want to do this. Therefore, it's done. Oh, we've got some work to do to undo the anxiety that has been built up inside of us. And so, so Paul tells us, here's what we do. Be anxious about nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Be anxious about nothing. Rather, pray about everything. Don't be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. We're to pray. We're to turn to God. We're not to, to try to stuff it down. We're not to try to bury it and act like it doesn't exist. We're to let it be known to God. We're, we're to surface it, but give it to God. In 1 Peter, in chapter 5, he says that we are to cast our anxieties onto him because he cares for us. We're to, to take our anxieties and throw them onto Jesus, to God, because he cares for us. Anyone, um, like, really scared of spiders or cockroaches? We, we got a few, okay. Gina, we'll go with you. Which one was it, a spider or a cockroach? Cockroach, oh my gosh, Stephanie will literally call me. Actually, now they just put a bowl over it and leave it for me when I get home. <laughs> Right? They just like, all the girls, they just drop a bowl or a cup over it and leave it for me for when I get home. Right? So now imagine that a cockroach has managed to make its way upon your, your body. It is crawling on your, your leg. What are you going to do? Are you going to scream? There's going to be some scream. Of course, given, right? I'm going to scream and, and perhaps hyperventilate, right? But you're going to like, you're going to probably knock it off. You're going to swipe at it, right? But but let's be honest, man, cockroaches are brutal. That thing could just turn around and come right back, right? You gotta, you've gotta separate yourself from that cockroach. But what if it's like a rabid cockroach and it is just out for you? And it's, so, but what if instead Chris is like, here, let me take it. And so you can just take that cockroach and give it to Chris and he's gonna just, it's done, right? Because that's what Chris would do. He just crushed that cockroach. Right, and so God's like, hey, take your, your crawling anxieties that work its way over your body and don't just like try to knock them off, but take them and give them, throw them to someone who can handle it. Throw them to someone who will take our anxieties and just squash it in his hands. This is the, this is the imagery of 1 Peter 5. Cast your anxieties on him. Right, take them and throw them on God. I am anxious about paying my bills. Okay, don't bury it. Throw them on God. Talk to God with them. Because he cares for us. He cares about our anxieties. He cares about our fears. And so how do we do that? By prayer and supplication. Prayer is the broadest, most general term of communication with God. Right, prayer is our free therapy session. It is sitting down with God and just pfft, talking and communicating anything and everything, right? I'm just talking. 
Maybe my prayer is going to be in song. Maybe my prayer is going to be in reading and listening to his word. Maybe my prayer is in journaling. Maybe my prayer is as I'm driving down the road or walking to class. I'm just talking to God. And Paul says, take all of your concerns and just talk them out with him. Just tell him what you're thinking and feeling. Because that actually helps us release the anxieties that are bottled up inside of us. Just talk them out with, with God. At our retreat, we took some time just to take, we started our solitude time by saying, okay, take everything in your thoughts and just journal it out. Like, don't, don't answer it. Anything that you're worried about, thinking about, pl- planning for, all of it, just write it down. Because that way you have it and you, you're not going to forget it. You can go back to it. Now go to God's word and just spend time with him. Right, just, just read and listen all of your to-do lists, all of your things, all of it's still there. You're not going to forget it. Just spend time with him. Then go back and, and see if your perspective has changed on some of these things. See if perhaps spending time praying, communicating with God has released you from some anxiety with these things. Right, and so we can, we can do that with God. We can pray to God. We can just talk to him. He also says supplication. Supplication is a more specific use of, of the word prayer. It's, it's I am not just praying in general, I'm praying for this specific thing. I'm not just praying, hey, God, protect me from cockroaches. I'm supplicating, God, protect me from this man-eating cockroach crawling on my leg right now. Right, that's the difference between general, like, protect me. God, this thing is, is overtaking me. And that's what supplication is. And, and so Paul says, hey, rather than being anxious, Spend time talking to God. Take your specific fears and anxieties and, and, and talk to God. Tell them to God. Cast them on God. Martin Luther, I love this quote. He said, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. That's not a person doing nothing. That's a person giving his to-do list to someone who's far more capable than him. I have so much to do I gotta spend the first three hours wor- working with God on this stuff. Otherwise, it's gonna destroy me and eat me up. But that's, it sets us free from our anxieties and concerns. But let's not forget the last part with thanksgiving. Take your anxious concerns and your cares, and by prayers and supplication, throw them to God with thanksgiving. When do you thank someone? When they help you, right? I need help, you help me, thank you. Right, I have a request, you answer it, thank you. You give me a gift, thank you. Right, so so Paul is, is taking the Ron Swanson approach here, right, please and thank you, right? He is just saying, make your request known to him with thanksgiving, with a confident belief that it's already done. Hey God, here's my concern, please and thank you. It's taken care of, because I know you've got me. I'm gonna be honest, that's hard for me. It's hard. I think part of our uh, curse in this country is we don't need much. We're really self-sufficient and dependent on ourselves, and so we don't, we don't need God to step in and do something. And so the idea of like, hey, God, here you go. Oh, good. He's taking care of that. For me, I'm like, hey, God, here you go, and I'll bring that back to myself, and I'll get to work on it, right? Anyone else do that? Hey, God, let me pray for help in this regard. Thank you for hearing. Now I'll take it from here. And I just go back, like the idea of let me give you this request and then believe and know that you will actively do something and do something good about it, that's tough for me. I'm guessing it's tough for all of us because that is not how we, that's not what our culture teaches us. Our culture teaches us, you want something done, roll your sleeves up and get it done. And, And God says, no, throw that to me. Perhaps he'll tell you to go do something, but perhaps he's just gonna take care of it. But man, I just don't think that way much. I gotta work on saying, all right, hands off, I'm done. He's gonna take this. Here, God, I'm anxious about this. God, I'm anxious about paying for college. Will you please provide? Thank you for providing. No, I don't know how he's gonna provide. I don't know if his provision will be the way I would have thought or some other way, right? A lot of times we're like, God, the only answer is this. Well, maybe not. Right? We don't know everything. God's got a much bigger perspective and vantage point. But do we trust that he will answer and he will answer with what is good and best for us? That's how we can pray, throw our anxieties and say, thank you for doing that. That's a work in progress. But, but that's how we live anxious-free lives. 
I want to skip verse 7 um, because 7 and 9 are really just a repeat. So I want to I go back to now the fourth imperative, which is think about what is true and good and right. Paul says, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you and I think about is what we become. What you and I think about, we are biologically forming neural pathways in our brain, and that is how we live life. That is what we become. And so if my thoughts are always negative, my life is going to be negative. If I'm always thinking about the worst case scenario for my job, then I'm probably going to be constantly anxious about my job and worried about performing well. And then I'm actually not gonna perform well because I'm so wound up and tight about, am I doing this right? If I'm constantly anxious uh, about that people are untrustworthy and, and they're going to hurt me at some point, then what am I going to do? I'm going to keep people at a distance. And they probably won't hurt me, but I'll also probably not know love like God intended me to know. Because if that's what I'm thinking about, that is what I'm forming my brain and my life to live in response to. What we think about is what we become. If I'm constantly thinking immoral and lustful thoughts uh, about women, how am I eventually going to treat women? the way that I form my brain to think about them. But if I'm constantly inputting images that are debasing, how am I going to see people? Probably the way I have formed and trained my brain to think and to see people. Right? So, so the Bible continually tells us to be transformed in the renewing of our mind. Let our minds be literally transformed to see the world differently and to live differently in this world. Paul gives us this list of things, and I have a, like a, a, a T-chart thing. Um, right, Michaela, do you have a chart there? Boom, oh, okay. I guess it doesn't translate as well. So imagine there's a, right? So I can think about things that are true, or I can think about things that are false or a lie. I can think about things that are honorable, or I can think about things that are corrupt or untrustworthy. I can think about things that are just or things that are unfair. I can think about things that are pure or I can think about things that are dark or dirty. I can think about things that are lovely or repulsive and ugly, commendable or wrong or bad or, or want to hide, excellent or inferior and sloppy, worthy of praise or, or shameful. We have the power and the instruction to take our thoughts captive and to choose what we think about and what we dwell on, right? So, so when it comes to my, my coworker, am I thinking about my coworker in ways that are um, dirty or pure? A am I thinking about, um, let's see, um, myself in ways that are true or a lie? Gosh, come on, how many of us just repeat lies of who we are to ourselves? A and then we eventually believe them. I'm ugly. I'm unlovable. This makes me look bad. Yo, we are forming our brains and how we think about ourselves and then thus how we live. Right? Um, I can think about um, what I watch, what I consume. Is it commendable? Would I commend it to others or is it bad? Is it something I'd want to like hide my kids from seeing or, or, or vice versa, right? What are we thinking about? What we think about is what we, is, is what we become. So how do we take our thoughts captive? One, first thing you can do, proactively choose what you put in. Right? Some thoughts, you don't, they, they, they just come. Either from life experiences or what, but there's a lot of thoughts we are choosing to put into our brain and into our mind. Right? So we can choose what we put in. First suggestion, Memorize the Bible. Like, just don't memorize Taylor Swift lyrics. Memorize the Bible. Then get to Taylor Swift lyrics. Right? There's nothing wrong with memorizing a song, but, but if that's all we're memorizing, we're never getting to Scripture. We are choosing what we're putting into our brain. Right? Mem memorize these. That's a lot of think words to remember. True, lovely, pure, honorable. Like, are you really going to walk around and every thought be like... No, but if we just memorize it, it just becomes a part of us. 
It just becomes a part of how we view and th- see the world. Memorize the scripture. Put in more of Jesus and leave less time for other stuff. You w- I promise you, you will see a fundamental difference in your life. Do that for the next six months, and I promise you, you will see a difference six months from now. All right? That, I'm telling you. It's up to you if you want to try that or not. Learn to identify lingering thoughts. Here's another practice. What if every night or at some point every day you just journaled the things that consumed your thoughts that day? Gosh, I thought about work and how scared I am at work again today. And you start to realize 14 days later, I think about this all the time. Next time when that thought is coming up, it's going to be in the forefront of your mind which will allow you to be able to go, okay, that thought's here, what do I do with this? But what is true about this thought? Right, what is true about my, my coworkers versus what are the lies I've been building myself with? Right, maybe you journal about you know, your, your boyfriend or girlfriend. Gosh, I don't, I don't think that she likes me. I don't think that she likes me. You're like, I see a pattern here. I think about this all the time. Okay, next time that thought comes up, you're, it's, you're aware. You're able to do something with this now. What are we doing? We're filtered. Okay, what is true here? What is a pure thought when it comes to my girlfriend? Right, we've got to become aware of these things, and we can do that by journaling, by helping ourselves know. And then as you become aware, you filter those things through the list. What is honoring to God? What is reflective of Jesus? What is right and good? And over time, biologically, your brain neural pathways will change, and so will your life. Like, it will lead us more towards Christ. I love how the Bible syncs up with science in so many ways. It's how God made us. So these are the imperatives. And the result, verse 7 and 9, the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, obey the commands, and the God of peace will be with you. It's not that the God of peace has left. It's that we have left him. Right? The God of peace is there, and as we look to him, as we rejoice in the Lord, even when suffering is happening, right? as we learn to be more gentle and easygoing, as we stop being anxious and instead throw our cares to him, as we think about what is true and right and good, we are positioning ourselves closer to the peace of God. He is there for us. We will find more peace because he will guard us in that peace as we turn to him. He's not left us. He's not abandoned us. He's not holding back. It's that oftentimes we have turned away. And so the invitation is, no, learn to to face him and you will find the peace of God that will guard you and and transcend you. I want to read this quote as we we conclude. This is Abraham Lincoln um, before the Battle of Gettysburg. And his, his, gen, his soldiers and they noticed that he wasn't anxious or worried. And so General Daniel E. Sickles asked him about that. How are you not anxious about it? And he said, well, I will tell you how it was. In the pinch of your campaign up there, when everybody seemed panic-stricken and nobody could tell what was going to happen, oppressed by the gravity of our affairs, I went to my room one day and locked the door and got down on my knees before Almighty God and prayed to him mightily for victory at Gettysburg. I told him that this war was his and our cause his cause, but we could not stand another Fredericksburg or Chancellorsville. And after that, I don't know how it was and I cannot explain it. Soon a sweet comfort crept into my soul. The feeling came that God had taken the whole business into his own hands and that things would go right at Gettysburg and that is why I had no fears about you. He just talks about what the Bible tells us, which is as we turn to him, with our anxieties, as we set our thoughts to be on what is true and right, that his peace will guard us. This peace that doesn't make sense. Like, how do you have peace in this? His peace will be present in our lives if we turn to him and trust him. And so, you know, that's my hope for us today, that we will trust his word and the spirit in us, and that we will know the peace that God has for us as we rejoice in him, as we let our reasonableness be known to all, as we are anxious about nothing but pray in everything, as we 
think about that which is true and good and right, that God will fundamentally transform our lives, not just for heaven one day, but here today, that we can know the abundant life that Christ came to bring us. That's Paul's aim. It's of surpassing value and worth, knowing Jesus. All right, Paul, how do we do that? Here you go. Here's some steps for how we can actually know Christ. All right, let's pray.